Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we're going to talk about one-on-one -on -one games, which is playing a tabletop role-playing game or an adventure with just a single game master and a single player. This might be done as a side game, where a player character does some individual quest before they return to the rest of the party for the main campaign. Or maybe it might serve as an origin story, where the uh, single character does their adventures before they hook up and join the rest of the campaign. Or it could just be done as an entire one-on-one -on -one campaign that's only ever going to have a single player and a single GM. This is a topic that I've been asked about quite a bit over the years, and I've always found it just kind of a bit of an odd question. I mean, I always just assumed that most game masters, if not every game master, had done one-on-one -on -one adventures before. My own first attempt at trying to game master was done with only a single player, which was pretty fortunate that I did it that way because that game was pretty bad and there was only one other person in the world that saw that. Less people to silence. I've seen one-on-one -on -one games be called duet games, which is a great name for it. I absolutely love the way that sounds, duet games. However, that also sounds a little bit more romantic than my one-on-one -on -one games usually are. My own group and I, we've always referred to these as solo games, or if we have a case where we've got you know two players and a single game master, we'd refer to those as duo games. And that's just pretty much what I'm always going to call them, despite the fact that most people consider uh, the term solo game to be referring to a case where a game master is game mastering themselves. There's only one person in the room playing, just playing alone. Those are referred to as solitary games, which I'm not going to be discussing solitary games today and how to do those, so I'm not going to be teaching you how to play with yourself. At least not today. But I will be discussing running small, intimate, one-on-one -on -one games, because there's quite a bit we can actually talk about on this subject, and there's a lot of benefits to doing these type of games, as well as a few hurdles that GMs and players might have to overcome, as well as a couple tricks that I can share to hopefully make those one-on-one -game -one games better for everybody. One-on-ones are absolutely great for doing those types of adventures that are dedicated to doing something that one character is really, really good at, or that one player wants to do that maybe the rest of the group doesn't want to do, and you don't want to spend a large part of a group's game session just dedicating it to that one player. Uh, that way they get to have that while everybody else is just kind of sitting there and watching. Such as a thief run, where your burglar character is breaking into and robbing houses or some fortress and having rooftop chases, getting chased by the local thieves guild. Or an elaborate assassination, where your assassination character is infiltrating a compound and maybe using disguises or other tricks in order to close a contract. Fighters might have gladiatorial combats in an arena or someplace, while spellcasters might be going to their temple or wizard school in order to endure some sort of special test or training. And of course, hacking adventures may be set primarily in cyberspace with our console cowboys storming the net. During a one-on-one -on -one game, players get to enjoy 100% of the Game Master's attention. In a normal game, when you've got a full group of players around the table, the Game Master's attention is getting pulled a half dozen different directions. You know, we're doing this, and now we're doing this, and now we're doing this now, and we're constantly switching and not nearly spending too much time with any one player in order to spread out the attention and not have anybody at the table just feel neglected like the Game Master isn't listening to them. One-on-one -on -one games also move faster without having to share the clock as one character goes and does this while another goes and does that, getting supplies or whatever else it is that all the other player characters are doing. Or that one player who just hogs the spotlight and their character is trying to awkwardly flirt or haggle with a shopkeep while the rest of the people around the table are just sitting there and watching. Or in combat situations where we're doing the combat round and we do one player and the next player and the next player and the next player and then back to the game match. Uh, so your player, you know, they get to have like one quick moment, they get to roll the dice and do something exciting, and then they have to sit there for a few minutes in order for it to go around the table and get back to them. With one-on-ones, it's not like that at all. It is just back and forth, more like a tennis match. We don't have to endure long debates as the group is discussing their plan to death. Nope, there's just straight to it. One-on-ones are much more go-go-go. 
Many of the fictional heroes that we try to emulate through our tabletop games are really solo characters. Conan, John McClane, and the man with no name. And for Call of Cthulhu, one-on-ones are far more Lovecraftian than you would have with a large group. I would love to see a lot more Call of Cthulhu adventures designed to be for one-on-one -on -one play. Okay, enough singing their praises, let's talk about how to get the most out of your one-on-one -on -one game. First, Game Masters. You need to tailor the game for one-on-one -on -one play. I already mentioned thief runs or arena combats, tailoring the adventure for the character type that you have. Focus on the character's strengths and the character's personality. You want them, of course, using all their strengths. If they're an Egyptologist, they need adventures or excuses to use those particular skills. Design the adventure so that the character has a chance to shine. And don't just tailor the game for the character, but also for the player. What is it that the player wants? In large groups, where you've got five players sitting around the table, you have to balance what all the individual players might want in order to have everybody to have the best time that they can. You know, this person wants lots of combat, and this person wants lots of puzzles, and this other person wants, you know, high role play, while this person over here really doesn't want that much combat, so they don't always mesh together as far as, you know, what it is that everybody wants. So a game master has to do a little bit of give and take, you know, that way this game focuses more on this, while this game focuses more on that the next time, in order for every everybody to have the best time that they can. One-on-one -on -one play, it is a lot easier to do. 100% of your players want the exact same thing as each other because 100% of your players are all the same person. So find out what it is that that player wants, and that's what we're going to do. Now, while most characters will work perfectly fine for solo play, players who are creating their character with the intent of only using this for one-on-one -on -one games should also tailor their character to fit best for it. Your character is going to have to do everything. In a group, we can divide things out, but in a group of one, that means that one player character is going to have to be able to do it all. So any skills or abilities that the player thinks are essential for this one-on-one -on -one campaign, that character is going to have to do them. So a player might need to spread out their skill points a bit in order to get a solid foundation and get to be able to do a little bit of everything that they need to be able to do. So in a skill-based system, once again, bringing us back to Call of Cthulhu, your character is going to have to handle all of the investigation, all of the library search, all of the sneaking, and all of the combat. You don't want to spread this out to the point where you spread your skill points out so thin that now you're really just bad at everything, and you're not good at anything, so you still have to be able to focus on certain specialties, but you're going to have to spread it out just a little bit more than you might be able to do in a, in a larger group where everybody can specialize that little bit better because they know that all the other characters are going to be able to take up any slack in any areas that their character might not be that good at. This, of course, all depends on what type of game it is you want to do and what game system it is that you're running to see how well you can tailor it for that specific one-on-one, -on -one. but it is something that players should consider doing, and if they can, try to make their character more suited for example exactly what it is that they're trying to do. Next, Game Masters, you should probably lower the combat challenges. In a group game, you can get away with lots of opponents and big threats because you're spreading that combat out across the entire party, but with one-on-one -on -one games, you're now focusing all of those opponents against a single target. Many games have flanking or overwhelming rules, and it might not take much in order for some opponents to drop a single player character, even if you're only using a bunch of weak opponents. You know, sure, those goblins might do much you know, by themselves, but once you throw in five goblins and all those goblins are now attacking only one player character, it doesn't take that much before that player character ends up dropping under all those attacks. Also, the player might just be having a bad dice day. We've all had them before. In those games where you just fail every single roll. And having multiple players around the table, that can help offset that. You got one player that's doing just really terrible rolls that day. They're not rolling anything above a seven. And your other players can kind of make up the difference and that way the whole game doesn't sink as a result. But if you've only got one player and that player is having a bad dice day, that means the whole group is having one. So give the players less opponents to fight. Maybe just a single bad guy. You know, see how that works out before you throw in a second bad guy for them to face. But also have the bad guys be less inclined to just outright 
kill the player character if they're victorious in the fight or once that character goes unconscious. They might capture them and try to ransom or interrogate them, and now the player character has to escape, and we get to have a fun adventure of them trying to do some sort of breakout. Or the bad guys might just simply rob the PC, and now the PC, uh, they wake up in an alley and all their stuff is gone, but now they're conscious and they get themselves collected together and it's time to go and get their stuff back and we get to have more adventures. Or if we're doing arena fights, like we talked about earlier, have the Emperor character that's overlooking the, the arena, you know, give the thumbs up at the end, uh, telling that the unconscious player character should be allowed to live, and then they're dragged away and healed up, and now they can fight again another day. Duels for honor might just be for the first blood instead of to the death. Whatever it is, the cost of losing that combat might need to be lowered at least more often than it is in a regular game for solo games. That way we've got a player character that could keep surviving and keep fighting and keep having fun. In addition to that, have more ways that the character might be able to avoid combat altogether. Uh, maybe they can sneak past or bribe their way past or roleplay their way past. It doesn't just have to be combat as the only solution to combat encounters. And not just combat, but lower other challenges as well. A lot of games, at least the ones that I run, might involve some obstacle that requires some figuring out, a way to challenge the players themselves and not just the players' dice. However, when you're throwing an obstacle in front of an entire party, you've got the combined brains of the room in order to figure that out, you know, trying to solve this puzzle or obstacle or just work past it. So even if you're giving them some sort of simple puzzle, you're very likely to have somebody in the room who's going to be able to figure out the solution. But if you've only got one player in the room and they lack the, the benefit of that group brainstorm of everybody thinking about this problem, if they're not able to figure out a solution or maybe they're not able to figure out in a short time and it takes a long time for them to figure out something that you thought was going to be pretty simple, that's how the game can just completely grind to a halt. That is no fun. Not for the player and not for the game master. No one in the room enjoys that. It's one thing to challenge the player, it's another thing to stump the player. Remember that once again we are tailoring these games to the particular strengths of the player and as to the strengths of the character, so keep in mind that even though something might be their strength, there's still only one of them and maybe one of them isn't going to be enough to do this simple thing that you've put before them. Which brings us to the next and my favorite part of this whole video, sidekicks. Sidekick NPCs can be a lifesaver on one-on-one -on -one adventures. I've talked about NPC companions before and why they're useful and things to look out for. That's a whole 20-minute video all by itself, so if you want to know more about it, you can watch that video. I'll stick a link below at the end for it. There is no need to repeat all of that here. An NPC companion or sidekick can be great for one-on-one -on -one games. That companion might have some skill that the player character is lacking in, or be able to help them out with combat, either making attacks or receiving attacks. That way the PC isn't the only one getting attacked by those, you know, five or nine goblins. We can go ahead and half the attacks that one of those characters is making. Or they can staunch the player's wound if that character goes unconscious, or simply help out with certain tasks that more than one person needs to do. Those are all great great reasons to have a sidekick, and they're all pretty obvious reasons to have a sidekick. I'm pretty sure that most of you already knew that walking in. But they also work for a whole party as well. That's not really a, a benefit that they get above when you use them for a whole party. So the big benefit that a sidekick can offer a one-on-one -on -one game that they can't really offer a regular group is that they can serve as a player's sounding board. As the moon's light passes through the lens atop the pillar, a pale beam shoots down and missing the altar by several feet. Given the current position of the moon, it might take eight months before they can align and the door can open. Well, I ain't got eight months. What to do? Maybe I could... No. I'm gonna... No. Now, if we're to add a sidekick to that situation, given the current position of the moon, it might take eight months before they can align and the door can open. We don't have eight months, Herb. No, we don't, sir. Do you think we could move the altar closer to the beam? Move the altar, sir. Yeah, that won't work. The altar is too heavy. Good point, sir. Maybe we could... Yes, sir? Well, if we can't move the altar, we don't have eight months for the moon to align. What about the beam? The beam, sir. Yeah, we could use a mirror to reflect the beam onto the altar and open the door. 
We could try that. Excellent idea, Herb. Just doing my best, sir. Okay, so here we have the exact same situation. In one of them, the player character is just sitting there alone and quietly thinking, trying to figure their way through the problem. Nothing is really happening. It's a pretty boring scene as these two people are just staring at each other in silence. But then in the other, we have a sidekick, and the player and the sidekick are able to talk with one another, and the player is able to voice their ideas and say them aloud. And they're kind of working through the process of being able to problem solve whatever this obstacle is. The NPC really wasn't adding anything to that. That entire dialogue. They're mostly just repeating back what the player was saying to them, but at one point they also prompted the player into speaking a little bit more and be able to get that player to encourage them to say their thoughts aloud. But mostly they were just there being an ear. But the process of being able to voice it, to be able to say it aloud and work our way through the puzzle, it's kind of like real life when you're wrestling with some sort of problem and you can't figure it out. So you call your buddy or your coworker over and you're hoping that maybe they can offer you some suggestion. So they come over and you're talking to them and you're about halfway through the explanation or 75% through the explanation and all of a sudden it just clicks and it dawns on you and you've got the answer and you're like, wait, no, never mind, I got it. And they're all like, well, hey, you know, I'm happy I could help. And then they just wander away, kind of wondering what the big deal was. As I discussed in my NPC companion video, one of the big risks that you might face when you've got an NPC companion that's traveling with all the player characters is that the players might try to fish for some sort of hint or solution by asking the NPC, you know, what is it you want to do? Thinking they're going to trick the GM into just giving them the answer and they don't have to think for themselves and that the NPC is just going to uh, throw out obviously the right answer every single time they ask for help. Now this is still true, that's still possible and something you might face in a one-on-one -on -one game. But in a solo game like this where your player dynamic is literally just a player and you know they don't have anyone else to brainstorm around the table and able to voice their ideas to, the biggest thing that an NPC companion or side kit can give them is a way that they can voice their thoughts and hear them aloud. That way they can figure out different problems and be able to solve them a whole lot faster. And we can avoid having those big, long, boring silences as that one player around the table is just looking at the board and trying to think of something to do. So sidekicks, in addition to all the great stuff that an NPC companion can normally give them, like healing or combat, allows a player to work through their own ideas and can make them invaluable to use in solo games. Okay, that is it. Not much to this video really. Hopefully some of you out there were able to find this helpful and might encourage some game masters or players to try their hand at running one-on-one -on -one games or anyone out there that's been playing or running one-on-ones. You know, hopefully you were able to find something that could enhance everybody's enjoyment on that. Games like this can be a lot of fun. They can feel a lot more personal and they can feel a lot faster on both sides of the game master screen. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. And also hit that little bell notification thingy if you want to get updates whenever we post a video. Till next time, amigos, stay awesome. You know, I think it'd be pretty cool if I could play the sidekick and the NPC would be the hero. Just like Kurt Russell did in Big Trouble in Little China, best sidekick ever.